Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India I am Dr. Priyanka Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science, DAV PG College, Varanasi. And today I will be discussing the topic International Terrorism. In the previous lectures, I have dealt with the emergence of the discipline of international, religion, international relations. Then I have covered the theories of international relations like idealism, realism, liberalism, Marxism, social constructivism, feminism, international organization that is United Nation, regional organization that is European Union. And I have also discussed on the uh, topic of human rights. And in this lecture, this is my ninth lecture and I will be focusing on the topic international terrorism. So to begin with, with the end of the cold war, there has been the beginning of new kind of issues and challenges in the global politics. Because now the world was facing non-traditional security threats. Earlier, the dimension of security was only limited to the state security. Just securing the border of the state and most of the job was done. But as the time passed by and with the spur in the technology, there has been a spur in the new kind of challenges that the world is started facing. The rapid movement of goods, services and people also led to the rapid movement of non-traditional security threats. And terrorism is one such challenge. So terrorism can be considered as a political strategy to gain certain political ends, certain political goals. Terrorism, as we say that it is a concept that fits within the purview of non-traditional security threat. But terrorism as a concept is not a novel thing. It is as old as human race. Focusing on the history of terrorism, the term terrorism is associated with the history of France. We all know about the French Revolution. As a result of French Revolution, there has been a rise of a group called Jacobians. And they were revolutionary group. They belong to extreme left wing. And they fought for the rights of the middle class and working class. So they started challenging all those institutions, those who were not in the favor of the growth of the working class. Later on, terrorism came to be associated with communists. And communist has the aim of insurrection. That is why they were put in the category of terrorists. Now towards First World War, terrorism was used by those who wanted their nation. It is usually believed that terrorism is a non-Western concept. Like in the previous lecture, when I was discussing about human rights, human rights is basically considered as a western concept. 
but terrorism is considered as a non-Western concept. But we should not forget the fact that there has been terrorist movements in Western countries too like Northern Ireland. In the Western point of view, terrorism is primarily linked to Middle East and Islamic world. The growth of terrorism is because of them. If we have to define terrorism, that what is terrorism? There is no concrete definition of terrorism as per international law. According to United Nations Security Council, terrorists act are those criminal actions committed against people with the intent to cause death or severe injury. So, first thing that we should keep in mind is it is criminal action and the intention is to cause death or severe injury. Why they want to cause death and severe injury? Why it is committed against people? The answer to this is that the act of terrorism, the action of terrorism is basically aimed at creating a state of terror in the general public. And as they are creating a state of terror, a feeling of terror among the general public, it will in turn compel the government to do or not to do from certain things. If they are taking any action against any terrorist group or any, they are working on any issue which is in favor of terrorist they want the government not to do that. So, they will create a situation of fear among the general public, so that government can get compelled not to do that. Or if they want government to do anything, for example, if that any group is demanding the release of any particular set of prisoners, then they will commit such act, so that government is compelled to work as they are, as they desire. Whom de desire of whom? That is of terrorists. So, there are different interpretation of terrorism. First, to talk about conventional ter interpretation. So, conventional interpretation of terrorism is that it is attack on civilized humanitarian values. Because in a civilized society, there is no room for terror, no space for terror, terror. So, first that is if we conventionally interpret the concept of terrorism, it is attack on civilized humanitarian values and in turn they are threat to the whole lot of humanity because if any act is intended to cause death or injury of any person or group of person, that is of course a threat to humanity. The from radical point of view, if we interpret the concept of terrorism, the radicals view terrorism as an attempt to advance justice. Because as per radical point of view, terrorism is an attempt to counter bigger violence, to stop bigger violence, to counter bigger violence, this violence is done, so that this bigger violence can be stopped. That means, violence will be curbed by violence. Third is the critical school. So, critical school basically aims to, they are basically against essentializing terrorism. So, they 
basically warn against linking terrorism to a particular religion or culture or for that matter place or region. So, as per critical school of thought, terrorism is not necessarily related to any particular religion or place or region or culture. That is the reason that there are, as there are different interpretations of terrorism, terrorism is highly contested concept. There is no uniformity different people view it in different sense. In India, India is a place where terrorism has been, in India has suffered massively because of terrorism. So, India has defined terrorism in the 8th report on terrorism that got published in 2008 and according to the report, terrorism is an act of terror that includes any intentional act that means the act of terror is committed intentionally it is not something unintentional and that intentional act is of what it is of violence that is aimed to cause death or damage to property and this death and damage will induce fear in the group of people. That is what terrorism is. What are the essential characteristics of terrorism? Let us talk about that. So, terrorism is basically called as asymmetrical war. What is asymmetrical war? When the two, the parties to the conflict are not equal to each other, there is no equality. One is stronger and other is weaker or the means used by both the parties are not on equal terms. So, basically terrorism is considered as the weapon of the weak. Those who are weak, they resort to terrorism. So, as to fulfill their desires and they are knowing that they cannot prevail over their opponent, they cannot win in any kind of direct war. So, as they are knowing that they are weak, they cannot face their opponent in terms of power. So, they will go for guerrilla war because they know that, that their enemy is stronger, the greater strength of enemy. So, in order to compensate the greater strength of their enemy, they will go for guerrilla war. So, that they can prevail over their opponent, they can win because they know that in direct warfare they will lose. So, the strategy of terrorism includes war of attrition that is protracted struggle to weaken the power of enemy. It is a protracted struggle so that your enemy gets weakened. So, the distinguishing feature of terrorism is propaganda and highly publicized atrocities, so that these atrocities can create fear among the people and their enemy get intimidated. They can also, their act can also gain popular support or not gain popular support both the cases are possible. So, terrorism is ideologically contested, emotionally charged and a pejorative used term. There is a pejorative attached to this concept. 
Now, what are the types of terrorism? How can we say that, okay, this is, this is one type, this is second type, this is third type. What are the types of terrorism? So, first is terrorism is Walter Lacker characterized terrorism in two types, terrorism from above and terrorism from below. Terrorism from above is like this and terrorism from below is like this. So, what is terrorism from above? Below are the general public. So, if the government is doing anything that is causing fear among the general public, that can also be termed as terrorism. And as government is powerful, it is above the general public. So, this kind of act can also be termed as terrorism. The thing is that many of the counter insurgency operations done by the government also falls into the category of terrorism. But that terrorism is considered as terrorism from above or if any kind of ethnic cleansing is done by the government that is intentional in nature. that is also considered as terrorism from ever because there is something which is coming from above. Any kind of operation done by the government because this operation is directly and indirectly affecting the general public, creating fear among the general public. So, these kind of acts can also be termed as terrorism. We can't say that government and terrorism are not related to each other. They are related to each other. And their act is known as terrorism from above. That is called state-led terrorism, where the state is involved. Next is terrorism from below. Terrorism from below is led by the non-state actors, a group of people, for example, Al-Qaeda. That group can be called, their act can be called terrorism from below. So, the first categorization is terrorism from above and terrorism from below by Walter Lacker. There are other categorization also. First is political terrorism. What is political terrorism? Political terrorism basically is primarily used to create fear in the community or section of society for political purposes. Now, this kind of terrorism which is used to create fear in the community or any section of the society for some political purpose, this can be done to overthrow the state or to overthrow the foreign occupation. This is called political terrorism. Next is the global terrorism. Now, that terrorism which has been accepted and termed widely is global terrorism. So, political terrorism is not global terrorism because some sections of the world has not accepted it as terrorism. They have considered it as a regional problem. Global terrorism is global in nature, universal in nature. And why they are considered as global or universal? Because it was used to weaken the US hegemony. We all know about 9-11, where 
when the attack was done on World Trade Center. It can be termed as global terrorism because it challenged the hegemony of United States of America. It was done with the intention to weaken the US hegemony. That US hegemony whose hegemony couldn't, no state can dare to challenge US hegemony at that time in the year 2001. At that time, a group of people attacked World Trade Center in United States of America. So, that act became global in nature because that act was aimed to inflict damage or humiliation on global power. It was basically aimed to challenge the power of USA or to change global civilizational values. It can also be inferred that it was the offshoot of the concept of class of civilization. To question the supremacy of one civilization over other. Next is quasi-terrorism. Quasi-terrorism basically refers to activities that are similar in form and method to terrorism, but actually they are not intended to induce terror in the community. For example, Nuxtalism. If we view the things from the point of Nuxals, they say that they do not want to induce terror in the community. They are working for the welfare of those whose welfare is not taken into consideration by the government. But the section of the population that are getting affected because of their act, they term it as terror, terrorist act. They can be termed as quasi-terrorism. They fall in the category of quasi-terrorism. Then the state-sponsored terrorism that I have already discussed, terrorism from above. These kind of terrorism refers to those terrorist activity that are carried out by the government to fulfill their political purposes that can be against a particular section of community or any foreign nation. So, it is basically state sponsored because state is supporting that act directly or indirectly. Then religious terrorism. What are religious terrorism? Religious terrorism refers to those terrorist activities that are undertaken in the name of faith and religion. And it is against those who are of different religion. For example, if any bomb blast is being done in temple or Gurudwara, it is religious terrorism because this act is basically done not only to create fear, but to create fear in a particular community that belongs to any particular religion. So, their aim is religious. That is why they are known as religious terrorism. Then other category that is new terrorism. New terrorism is also religious terrorism because earlier forms of terrorism were secular. They were, they, they did not targeted any particular religion. They could be for the freedom of their country. They could be to end any particular regime, any particular rule. So, 
they were secular in nature but now the terrorism is taking religious shape so new terrorism is also religious terrorism because at present majority of the terrorist organization that are there in the world they have the religious characteristics and their ideology is religion because they consider their religion far more superior than other religions so religion itself become an ideology their ideology is religion now what are the reasons of terrorism why terrorism is done first is the ideological reason so if a group of people group of terrorists are engaged in terrorism and that engagement is based on their belief values and principles which may or may not be based on religion or politics they are ideological factors which are leading to terrorism for example the irish republican army al qaeda etc they have a particular ideology and to make their ideology supersede over others they are resorting the act of terrorism they are making terrorism as their tool next is the psychological reason so when the group of people are engaged in the act of terrorism for some personal reasons based on their psychological state they may be motivated by hate or desire for power it is the psychological reason which is leading to terrorism so for the psychological reason under it brain wash is done some group of people are recruited and then they are taught a particular lesson and they are compelled to view from a particular to uh, see and have the per perception from a particular point of view that is the psychological reason and then they they develop a kind of thinking where they hate a particular group or hate a particular region or hate a particular religion that is psychological reason and then strategic reason individuals may cause terrorist activity to fulfill strategic reason such as through their act they compel the government to take or not to take a particular step or certain steps so to do that people resort to violence so violence or terrorism becomes their means they become their tool to compel the government to fulfill their desires there has been lot of steps that has been taken internationally and especially after 911 now terrorism all over the world is considered as a threat to humanity and if we talk about the steps that is taken internationally united nation has an essential role to play because it is an international organization that got established with the aim to promote international peace and security and terrorism is posing threat to the security so united nation as an international organization has got the job 
to develop international cooperation and also to ensure that all the member countries work together against the act of terrorism because now terrorism has been accepted as a global problem it is not limited to any particular region so if it is a global problem the solution also have to be global and there the role of united nation comes and that becomes very important because it is the united nation only that can develop international cooperation because it is it has the task to secure cooperation as, as it works on the principle of liberalism which believes in cooperation so all the united united nation members adopted united nation global counter terrorism strategy and through this united nation global counter terrorism strategy steps are taken both individually as well as collectively on national and international level to counter terrorism so this is the one important step taken by the united nation to curb terrorism basically there are four principles of counter terrorism they are also known as the four strategies how to deal with terrorism so first strategy is addressing the conditions that lead to the spread of terrorism what are the causes what are the conditions that lead to the growth of terrorism because no one is born as terrorist terrorists are made they are constructed so if they are made if they are constructed why not to nip the problem in the bud so that it does not flourish it does not blossom so to address the conditions that led to the spread of terrorism that is the first strategy to counter terrorism then second is preventing and combating terrorism if terrorism is there the there is need to prevent and combat that and how that will be prevented and combated by building capacity to prevent and combat terrorism how to build the capacity the capacity won't be built until and unless united nation will be strengthened so by strengthening the united nation and by building capacity which of course requires resources then terrorism can be combated and then ensuring respect for human rights human rights those rights which we have because we are born as humans and no human has the right to take away or snatch away rights of other human being and terrorism is doing what it is taking away or snatching away the human rights of other human being so to ensure that all the sections of the society have equal respect for human rights and they have a respect for rule of law and what does rule of law says that 
नो बडी इज अब लॉ इफ नो बडी इज अब द लॉ हाउ कैन यू क्रिएट फियर एमंग द पॉपुलेशन द कॉमन पॉपुलेशन सो दीज आर द फोर प्रिंसिपल्स टू काउंटर टेररिज्म यूनाइटेड नेशन ऑल्सो इस्टैब्लिश्ड वेरियस कमिटीज टू कम्बैट टेररिज्म फर्स्ट इज यूनाइटेड नेशन सिक्योरिटी काउंसिल थ्री कमिटीज फर्स्ट अलकायदा एंड तालिबान सैंक्शंस कमिटी द काउंटर टेररिज्म कमिटी एंड वन फाइव फोर जीरो कमिटी एंड दीज थ्री कमिटीज वेर इस्टैब्लिश्ड to implement the specific resolution relating to terrorism so whatever the resolution that are getting passed to combat the terrorism they are these committees are there to implement those resolutions so according to united nations security council resolution 1456 that got passed in the year 2003 all nations must comply with international law while countering terrorism and respect international human rights and humanitarian law both human rights and humanitarian law needs to get respected and for that all nation have to comply to the international law if everybody will respect the international human rights and humanitarian law no act of terrorism will be done and to ensure that to implement that countries need to strive to improve conversation and understanding across civilization and settle unsolved regional issues to avoid targeting other religion and culture so whatever the causes of terrorism could be there first is the miscommunication or confusion regarding the intention of the other person or other community hate towards the other civilization or religion or culture if any regional issue is there for which two countries or two groups are fighting if these problems get resolved terrorism could be curbed so the need is that countries need to strive to improve conversation with each other and understanding across civilizations and solve those matters which have remained unsolved and for that they have to be mindful of the fact that they have to avoid targeting other religion and culture there are several other con conventions also that are aimed to curb this problem first is european convention on suppression of terrorism it was passed in the year 1977 then council of europe convention on the prevention of terrorism it was adopted in the year 2005 and it got entered into force in the year 2007 then international convention for the suppression of terrorist bombings adopted by the united nation general assembly on 1997 which entered into force in the year 2001 then international convention for the suppression of financing of terrorism because finance is one of the very important factor and to curb the terrorism there is a need to stop the finance so united nation general assembly adopted the international convention for suppression of financing of terrorism in the year 
that entered into force in the year 2002. Then International Convention for the Suppression of Act of Nuclear Terrorism, nuclear weapons, they are deadly in nature. So, this convention was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly on 2005 and entered into the force in the year 2007. Then organization of the African Union Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism adopted in Algeria and it entered into force in the year 2002. These are these were the international conventions. Now, as I already mentioned that India has also suffered a lot because of this problem of terrorism. Now, let us focus on the Indian approach. What is the India's approach? So, the government of India has offered five point formula to deal with terrorism. First, exchange of timely and actionable intelligence. If we talk about terrorism, one thing we have to keep in mind and that is the timely act. Suppose the government receives the information that there is a planning that a bomb blast will be done at that particular place at that particular time. For example, within an hour. So, rather than making strategies till the time that time passes by, there is a need for a timely thing, timely action and actionable intelligence. Intelligence should be strong that whatever information they are giving is accurate. Next is the prevention of misuse of modern communication system. We'll, we all are adopting modernization. There is technological advancement, we all are using technology. But this technology is also being used by the terrorists. So, if we are making positive use of technology, they are making the negative use of technology. So, government have to ensure that the misuse of modern communication system should not be there. Next is building capacities to increase border control. Of course, we are living in an era where non-traditional security threats are predominating. But we cannot deny the fact that traditional security threats are still relevant. And for that, border controls and securing the borders are very important. Then sharing the information on movement of persons, because this free movement of goods and services have also been used by the free movement of terrorists across the globe. They are sitting at one corner of the world and they are running the whole racket in whole world thanks to the technology. And then designation of counter terror focal points for effective response. This is the five point formula given by India. Now, coming to the comprehensive convention on international terrorism. India proposed comprehensive convention on international terrorism in the year 1996. And this convention proposes acceptance of universal definition of terrorism to be adopted in the domestic laws. Now, it is a high time that we should adopt a universal definition of terrorism. One terrorist can't be another's freedom fighter. We 
need to adopt a common definition that who is terrorist. And it also focuses on no differentiation between good and bad terrorist. Terrorist can't be good for anyone. So, this distinction of good and bad terrorist should not be done, should be avoided by every country of the world unanimously. So, there is a need to ban all terrorist group and shut down all terrorist camp irrespective of the country wherever they are. Then prosecution of all terrorists under special anti-terror laws and also mandatory extradition of terrorists involved in cross-border terrorism. Now, these were the points that were put through comprehensive convention on international terrorism. Now, what is the status of it? USA did not accept it because USA suggests to exclude the acts committed by its armed forces without the mandate of the UN. If USA would have adopted the comprehensive convention on international terrorism as it is, its armed forces could also be termed as terrorists. So, it did not accept it. OIC countries exclude national liberation movements and Latin American countries are concerned about human rights violation more than the terrorism. So, what is the progress so far? HCO has accepted it that is Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It has accepted the comprehensive convention on international terrorism. Though comprehensive convention is not in force, some other conventions are in force. In 1997, international convention for the suppression of terrorist financing was adopted. In 2005, international convention for suppression of the act of nuclear terrorism was adopted. Former Secretary General Kofi Annan also has suggested how to deal with terrorism. So, he has suggested the strategy which he terms as 5D. First, dissuade the terrorist group to resort to terrorism, the first step. Then, deny means to carry attacks. Then, deter states from supporting such groups because it is an accepted fact that terrorists get the support of the states. Without their support, they cannot flourish. So, Kofi Annan suggests to deter states from supporting such groups. Then, develop capacity of states to prevent terrorism and most importantly, defend human rights. Human rights need to be defended. So, according to Kofi Annan, any strategy to find to fight terrorism has to be grounded in rule of law, it has to be victim centric, it has to reduce the appeal of terrorists, civil society participation against that propaganda war should be avoided and to deal with root causes like poverty because poverty is one of the biggest cause of terrorism and cooperation among nations. So, there is a need to develop respect for rule of law, rule of law needs to be respected. Any act to curb terrorism should be victim centric, victim should not be, be doubly disadvantaged they should not face the double disadvantage. We have to reduce the appeal of terrorists. What terrorists should not be able to gain the sympathy. The 
civil society participation against propaganda war and we have to increase the cooperation among nations because there are some states that are supporting terrorism in some form or the other and we have to condemn terrorism in all the forms no good terrorism no bad terrorism so whosoever is there whomsoever is there and whatsoever is there and wheresoever is there terrorism needs to be condemned in each and every form and we have to implement international conventions conventions if not implemented are waste useless and the important thing is that for that global solidarity is needed if global solidarity will be there it will weaken the temptation to use terrorist act so we have to cooperate with each other we have to stand by each other to deal with this global phenomena now the strategies to deal with terrorism through different theories how the different theories view terrorism first talking about the realist approach realist offer no mercy to terrorism because realist view terrorist as threat to national security and if they are threat to national security they need to be crushed so we should not say that there are the rights of terrorist also no civil and political rights for terrorist now as per liberal point of view they suggest to distinguish between fundamentalists and the liberal values so we have to distinguish between the fundamentalism and the liberal values so they put us in a situation of dilemma because as per them terrorist also have civil and political rights they also have human rights so they put us in a situation of dilemma the critical school of thought suggest to distinguish between wholesale terrorism and retail terrorism so wholesale terrorism is terrorism from above and retail terrorism is terrorism from below the marxist school of thought says that there is a need to fight terrorism at two levels war of position and war of movement so war of position is indirect and it requires the use of soft power and war of movement is direct and states need to gain moral high ground and hence states need to appear more sensitive to human rights and protection of freedom and development now what social constructivist have to say they say that change your perspective we should not type cast this phenomena conventions need to be broken down there is a there can be labeling of certain groups because as per them everything is constructed and if everything is constructed then we cannot accept any discourse as it is we have to look into the ground we need to change our perspective so what are the counter terrorism strategies first is strengthen the state security state needs to be powerful to deal with terrorism then military repression so terrorism through military repression can be reduced to manageable level but it cannot be ended next is the heart and mind strategy do not deal with terrorism with only the symptoms rather 
treat the cause of terrorism and try to curb terrorism from there. Then political bargain, however, it may not work against the fundamentalist because fundamentalists want to create a new order rather than the political accommodation. So, in conclusion it can be said that international terrorism is significant threat to global security and if it is a significant threat to global security it needs to be resolved as early as possible because if it does not get resolved it becomes threat to the future of human civilization also not only the present because the act of terrorism is catastrophic and there is a fear of non-state actors acquiring even the weapons of mass destruction and they can destroy the whole world. So, combating terrorism requires cooperation among international states and international intelligence agencies to increase efficacy and efficiency. So, we must adopt security measures that are highly resilient to deal with terrorism and at the same time comply with international law and unanimously we have to be in one voice reject terrorism in any form anywhere because humanity has no option but to prevail over terrorism. Thank you. Hi, my name is Gillette Sam uh, and I teach sociology at uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, today I, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, what sociology is. Um, in order to uh, go ahead and study sociology, one of the things you need to develop is a sociological way of thinking. Uh, now this capacity to think in a sociological manner was termed as the sociological imagination by an American sociologist called C. Wright Mills in 1959. He argued that uh, in order to think in a sociological manner, you should be able to have uh, two different skill sets. The first skill set uh, would require you to have the capacity to think beyond uh, the problems that individuals face. So if you encounter a problem that someone, some one individual is facing, you should be able to connect it to a broader public problem. Uh, Mills gave the example of, uh, you know, people in his neighborhood. He says, if uh, there is one person who is unemployed in the neighborhood, that seems to be an individual problem. But as a sociologist, you're expected to dig around a little. So you come across a couple of other people in your neighborhood who are also unemployed. Uh, that indicates to you that rather than being a specific problem, there is a larger public issue at hand. So as a sociologist, you are supposed to, come by, uh, to look at individual problems and see how they are connected to broader public issues. Uh, the second uh, capacity that uh, you are expected to develop as a sociologist is the capacity to link uh, an individual's biography with history. Uh, historical thought may not come to you as the first thing that's connected to sociology, but it plays a pretty important role in the field. Uh, so Mills argues that uh, rather than looking at a problem in the here and now, it's important to trace that long historical trajectory that may be connected to this individual problem. Let me give you an example uh, from India, right? Um, Let's say uh, you look at uh, the women in your family. Uh, let's, let's see 
at what age do they get married. So uh, you may see that your sibling is getting married at the age of 25. Uh, go back one generation. At what age did your mother get married? You may find that she got married a little younger, let's say 21. Go back another generation. At what age did your grandmother get married? You may find that she got married even younger, uh, 18 or possibly even younger than that. So this capacity to see how the history of a family then influences the age at which your sibling got married, that is the capacity to bridge uh, the biography of a person or rather by a biography we can also think of uh, the biography of a particular problem with history. What has happened in the past? How is that connected to this individual or this problem in the present? Thank you.